My name is Killian Forrester, and this happened to me in October of 2011, in a place I knew like the back of my hand, the Redwood National and State Parks in California. I worked there as a ranger for eight years, and some called me a park veteran. It was a demanding job, the kind that got into your blood. I wasn't about to quit anytime soon. I liked hiking, camping, and most of all, being alone in the woods. The crisp air, the towering trees, the sound of the creek. It was my kind of paradise. That day started like any other. I laced up my boots, grabbed my gear, and headed out for my usual patrol route. It was a clear autumn morning, the first leaves starting to paint the forest floor in golds and reds. I hadn't been on the trail long before I noticed something amiss. Usually I heard birdsong, squirrels chattering, the rustling of small creatures in the undergrowth. Today the forest was unnervingly quiet. I felt uneasy, like something was watching me. As the day wore on, that feeling only intensified. Then I came across it, a sight so bizarre that my mind struggled to process it. A deer carcass, torn open and half devoured. But it wasn't the kill itself that sent shivers down my spine. It was the way the carcass was positioned. Somehow, it was hanging from the branches of a tree at a height that no predator I knew of could reach. As I approached to examine it, a wave of nausea washed over me. The slashes and tears on the animal looked surgical, calculated, like something methodical had done this. What the hell are you? I muttered under my breath. I'd seen mountain lions, bears, everything the forest housed, but this was different. I scanned the surrounding trees, my heart pounding in my chest. Suddenly, I spotted a flicker of movement, then a pair of glowing eyes staring down at me. They looked almost human, but far too large. What confronted me from the treetops was massive, far bigger than any human, with impossibly long, thin limbs. Its skin was dark, textured like rough bark. The thing tilted its head at an unnatural angle, and then in a blink, it was gone, vanished into the canopy. Panicked, I radioed for backup, stammering out a bewildered description of the creature. Ranger dispatch sounded amused, probably thinking I'd finally cracked under the strain of the job. But then, I heard my partner Ilara shouting over the radio. She was further down the trail, her voice panicked. Killian, I found something. You need to get here fast. It's bad. Really bad. A sickening dread pooled in my stomach. When I reached her, what I saw made me question my own sanity. A hiker lay sprawled on the ground, his body torn and twisted at impossible angles. There were the same methodical marks on him that I'd seen on the deer, a kind of calculated brutality that made me want to retch. Before I could process the horror of this, a scream tore through the trees. I bolted after the sound, Ilara trailing behind. Branches whipped at my face and roots snagged at my feet, but fear propelled me forward. When I reached a clearing, my blood turned to ice. Ilara was trapped. The creature had her pinned to the ground, one massive hand clamped over her mouth. Its other hand hovered inches from her throat. Long claws glinted in the dappled sunlight. Its eyes burned with an intelligence that was both eerie and terrifying. We locked eyes and for a frozen moment, I swear it paused as though trying to read my intentions. Then with a speed that defied its size, it grabbed Alara and vanished back into the dense foliage. I collapsed to my knees, a strangled sob escaping my throat. My mind raced. Was this some kind of freak of nature? An undiscovered species? Or something else? Something far more sinister? I knew no animal, no person could have done this. The woods that were once my sanctuary had become a nightmare and whatever lurked in those trees had broken something fundamental inside me. I knew I wasn't safe there anymore. But worse, neither was anyone else. When backup finally arrived, I looked like a madman, babbling about monsters and eyes in the trees. They sedated me, and when I woke up, they were chalking it up to stress, maybe even a bear attack. Alara's body was never found. 
despite extensive searches, no trace of her or the creature was ever recovered, leaving an open wound in our tight-knit ranger community. I resigned from my position a few weeks later. I tried to explain what I saw, but my words sounded hollow even to my own ears. The incident haunted me. The carnage, Elara's terrified eyes, the creature's unnatural intelligence. I couldn't shake the feeling that I wasn't just prey in this equation. I was being studied, hunted. The experience tore me from the wilderness I once loved and left me with an unshakable fear that lingers to this day. I tell this story now not for sympathy or to seek validation. Frankly, I don't expect anyone to believe me, but I can no longer stay silent. Something inhuman dwells in those woods, and it will strike again. It's only a matter of time. I can only hope that by sharing my experience, I might save someone else from the horror that haunts me. In the decade that followed, I couldn't settle. I moved constantly, from one anonymous city to the next, the paranoia gnawing at me like a persistent hunger. I tried therapy, support groups, even medication. Nothing could banish the chilling memory of those glowing eyes and the feeling of being watched. I became a shadow of myself, a husk driven by a constant irrational dread. Then the reports began. At first it was just whispers, hushed rumors among park rangers in Oregon, Washington. Disappearances, animal mutilations bearing the same methodical marks I'd seen years earlier. My heart pounded in my chest. It was back. No one connected the dots except for me. These incidents were treated as separate tragedies, freak accidents. I knew better. I felt sick with guilt and helplessness. Desperate, I tried to warn others, but it only fueled the perception that I was unhinged. My frantic stories about the creature only confirmed what everyone already suspected. The ordeal in the woods had shattered me. No one listened, and more lives were lost. I became an outcast and a cautionary tale. One night, an old colleague, Simon, reached out. I hadn't spoken to him since the Redwood incident. His voice on the phone was grim. Killian, people are dying out here. Rangers, hikers. It's like you said. You need to come back. With heavy reluctance, I found myself on a backcountry trail in Washington's Olympic National Park. The air carried the same damp smell of earth and pine needles that filled my nightmares. Simon, visibly shaken, filled me in. Over the previous weeks, three hikers had vanished and two rangers were found brutally murdered, bearing the familiar, terrifying wounds. The hunt began. We moved through the ancient forest, our senses on high alert. Simon knew I hadn't made up what I saw. My insistence, my unwavering fear, had slowly swayed him to the terrible truth. We were days deep into the wilderness, the dread hanging heavier with each passing night. Then came the sighting. It flickered across the trail, a hulking silhouette moving against the moonlight. We exchanged a terrified glance and took off in pursuit. The creature was fast, impossibly fast, its long limbs propelling it through the dense undergrowth at unnatural speeds. Twigs snapped and leaves rustled, but it was eerily silent. It led us deeper into the forest, into an area even Simon had never ventured into. Finally, we emerged into a hidden clearing dimly lit by the moon. In the center of the clearing stood a tree far more massive than any I'd ever seen. At its base were remnants, clothing, backpacks, bones, all stained with dark, dried blood. The sight turned my stomach. This was its lair, a gruesome trophy case. A low growl broke the silence, and the creature stepped out from the shadows. This time I saw it clearly, all seven feet of it, the impossibly long claws, the dark, leathery skin. But it was the eyes that chilled me to the bone, glowing pools of malevolence. Fear and fury surged within me, a desperate need to avenge Alara, those who died, and the shattered remains of my own life. I raised my rifle my hands shaking. Simon squeezed my shoulder, and with a grim nod, he drew his own weapon. 
Shots rang out, echoing through the clearing. The creature let out a guttural roar, but it didn't falter. It charged, its movements a blur of limbs and claws. We fired again and again, the desperation giving us an edge. I swore I saw the creature stumble, but it didn't fall. Suddenly, Simon screamed. He was on the ground, one massive hand wrapped around his leg, dragging him relentlessly toward the massive tree. I sprinted to his side, but the creature moved with blinding speed. With a sickening crunch, it snapped Simon's leg like a brittle branch, and his horrified screams cut through the night. I was next. A giant hand closed around my torso, lifting me off the ground. Pain flared through my ribs as it squeezed, and the gun clattered uselessly away. Its rancid breath washed over me as I stared into its fathomless eyes, and the last thing I saw was the unnatural bend of its arm as it brought one impossibly long claw closer. Then, darkness. The aftermath is a blur. I woke up in a hospital bed, battered, bandaged, but alive. The official report called it an encounter with a rogue bear, but the disbelieving look in the doctor's eyes suggested he knew better. The story made headlines, stirring the same fascination and doubt that followed me from Redwood. I never went back to the woods. Instead, I exist in the purgatory of populated spaces, the cities and crowds I once avoided. Sometimes, in the dead of night, I wake in a cold sweat and see the creature, its glowing eyes boring into my soul. I know in those moments that I haven't escaped it. Not really. It's still out there. A patient hunter waiting for the next opportunity, the next victim, and I'm powerless to stop it. My name is Asher Nolan, and this happened to me in August of 2006. I worked as a backcountry ranger in North Cascades National Park, Washington. I'm the type of guy who finds solace in isolation. So, after my wife left, the deep woods became my sanctuary. I knew every ridge, every crevice of those mountains. Maybe that's why I got complacent, and why I didn't see it coming. That August morning started like any other. I loaded my pack, grabbed a strong cup of coffee, and headed out for a routine trail survey. The air was crisp, with that first hint of the changing season, and the forest floor was turning from green to gold. Around midday, something caught my eye. A deer carcass, half covered by branches and dried leaves. I approached cautiously. It's always a risk coming across fresh carrion out here. But what I saw wasn't the work of a bear or cougar. The carcass wasn't torn apart, but rather disassembled. The cuts were precise, almost surgical, and the bones... They looked almost polished, gnawed clean beyond anything I'd witnessed before. It sent a shiver down my spine. Then I heard it, a low rustling from somewhere uphill. I called out, thinking it was another ranger. No answer. The trees up there were thick, dense, casting deep shadows across the steep slope. I scanned through the trunks, my fingers tightening around my rifle. There! A flash of movement between two towering pines. But whatever it was, it moved unnaturally fast, like nothing human. Hey! Stop right there! I shouted, trying to sound more confident than I felt. Silence. Then the rustling started again, closer this time, circling me. I felt a prickling on the back of my neck. I'd made a terrible mistake, venturing out alone into this remote stretch of the park. Suddenly, it lunged from the undergrowth, a massive blur of dark form and gleaming eyes. I'll never forget the first time I saw the creature in its entirety. It stood at least seven feet tall, impossibly thin, its skin a mottled brown-black, blending sickeningly well with the shadows. Its limbs were far too long, ending not in hands, but in razor-sharp claws. The creature tilted its head, and those eyes, large, almond-shaped, glowing with a predatory intelligence that pierced me to my core. The thing studied me, 
and for a terrifying moment, I knew what it was like to be prey. A piercing scream shattered the stillness. I recognized the voice. Amelia, one of the new arrangers. She'd been assigned a section of trail not far from mine. My blood turned to ice. That creature was heading right for her. I took off running, my heart pounding a frantic rhythm against my ribs. The terrain was rough, treacherous, branches whipping my face. I heard Amelia scream again, this time cut short. Then gunfire. Bursting through the trees, I stumbled upon a scene of horrific chaos. Amelia lay crumpled on the ground, her uniform soaked in blood, and the creature... It was crouched over her, its glistening claws ripping into her body with methodical precision. Pure, primal rage ignited within me. I lifted my rifle and fired, aiming for its head. The creature let out a guttural roar of pain and bolted into the trees. I raced to Amelia, praying for a miracle. But it was too late. The damage was catastrophic. The same clean surgical cuts I'd seen on the deer. She died right there in my arms, her eyes wide with terror. I'll never forget her last choked breath. The rest of that day was a blur. Radioing for backup, the evacuation team arriving, the questions. Questions I couldn't answer. There was no trace of the creature aside from pools of Amelia's blood and the unsettling sense that we weren't alone. They wrote it off as a bear attack. A rogue male, maybe. But I knew better. I spent the weeks that followed in a kind of numb haze, haunted by what I saw and what I lost. Then the nightmares started. Vivid, visceral dreams where the creature found me. Those eyes piercing the darkness. My sleep became a battlefield, leaving me exhausted. Hollow. My superiors started to notice. They suggested time off, a psych evaluation. Anything to explain why one of their top rangers was unraveling. I quit before they had the chance to fire me. My marriage was gone, my job, and now my sanity seemed to be teetering on the edge. Three months later, I was in a dusty bar in some forgotten corner of Wyoming, trying to drink away the memories, when I saw the news report. A gruesome discovery in Olympic National Forest. Two rangers killed. Same wounds as I'd seen on Amelia. That familiar dread twisted in my gut. It was back. And it was hunting. I stumbled out of the bar and made a frantic call to the lead ranger of Olympic, a tough old guy named Brooks. At first he scoffed, called me delusional. Then I described the creature, the impossible size, the eyes, the way it moved, and how it killed. That's when Brooks went silent. He told me to stay put, that he'd come out to Wyoming himself and talk to me. Brooks arrived a day later, a grim look on his face. He listened to my story, no judgment, no accusations of me being crazy. By the end, the man looked ten years older. He confessed that his rangers were scared, that there was a sense of something out there, something unseen. Brooks made the decision. We packed supplies and returned to Olympic, ready to face the monster that had shattered our lives. Our hunt began at dawn. Days turned into nights as we trekked into the ancient forests, an unspoken fear pressing down on us. Brooks, myself, and two more rangers, seasoned veterans like ourselves, hardened and armed to the teeth. We set up a perimeter in the area where the previous attacks happened, hoping to lure the creature into a trap. Night fell, an oppressive blanket of shadows and lurking dread. We huddled around a small fire, weapons at the ready, straining our senses for any sign of the beast. The silence was deafening, broken only by the crackling fire and the occasional unsettling rustling of leaves that sent chills down our spines. Hours ticked by with agonizing slowness. Just when my eyelids began to grow heavy, it happened. A twig snapped behind us. We whipped around, guns poised. There it was, a silhouette outlined against the faint moonlight. It moved with eerie grace, circling us like a predator sizing up its prey. We formed a defensive circle, 
our backs pressed together, watching every direction at once. The creature let out a low, guttural growl, a sound that echoed through the clearing, sending a wave of terror through our group. Suddenly, the creature charged. It lunged at Carter, one of the rangers, with blinding speed. The attack was a blur of claws and teeth. Carter raised his rifle, but it was too slow. The creature slammed into him, knocking him to the ground with bone-jarring force. His scream cut through the night as the creature began tearing into him. We fired our weapons, the gunfire deafening in the desolate forest. Desperation fueled us, but the bullets seemed to do little damage. Each blast only seemed to enrage the creature further. With an impossibly swift turn, the creature leaped at Brooks. He managed to raise his shotgun in defense. The weapon roared, blasting a chunk out of the creature's shoulder. It let out a piercing screech of pain but didn't retreat. The impact knocked Brooks off his feet. The creature lunged for his throat, those razor claws glinting in the firelight. I rushed forward, screaming incoherently and slammed the butt of my rifle into the creature's head. It staggered, disoriented. Blood oozed from the wound caused by Brooks' shotgun blast, but it wasn't enough to stop it. Carter was gone, a lifeless heap on the forest floor. The creature snarled, fixing its glowing eyes on me. Then, with a speed that defied its injury, it bolted back into the dense undergrowth and vanished. I knelt beside Brooks, his breathing ragged and shallow. He reached a shaking hand and clutched my arm. There's more, he coughed, blood bubbling in his throat. It's not... not just one. His eyes rolled back and his grip went slack. Brooks was dead. We were alone, two of us left against an unknown number of these monstrous predators. Exhausted and grief-stricken, we abandoned the clearing, retreating to the nearest ranger station as dawn broke over the treetops. I radioed for backup, my voice trembling as I tried to describe the night's horrors. Reinforcements arrived, armed to the teeth, ready for a fight. A manhunt ensued, the likes of which the national parks had never seen. Rangers, search and rescue, trackers, SWAT teams. They scoured the forest for days but found nothing. No trace of the creatures, no bodies, nothing but that dreadful silence hanging over the wilderness. In the end, the hunt was abandoned, the case officially closed, the deaths blamed on a possible rogue bear attack. The aftermath was a living nightmare. My report was dismissed. Trauma-induced hallucinations, they said. The other ranger who survived, a young, idealistic woman named Anya, backed up my story with chilling consistency. We were treated like pariahs, branded as unstable and written off as delusional. I lost the last shreds of my credibility, my career. But I know what I saw. I know what Anya and I faced in those woods. The park officials refused to believe us, refused to admit that there's something out there far more dangerous than any beast we've known. The public moved on, oblivious to the danger lurking in the shadows. But I can't pretend that it's over. Those eyes haunt my dreams, and every rustle of leaves sends a jolt of terror through my veins. I see reports of missing hikers, of unexplained animal mutilations in those same woods, and I know the truth. They're still out there, multiplying, learning, perhaps even growing bolder. A decade later, I live a solitary life on the outskirts of a small town. Most folks leave me alone, casting wary glances at the crazy old ranger who talks about monsters in the woods. Sometimes, in the dead of night, I look to the distant ridges, those mountains I once loved, and an uneasy feeling settles over me. I know the truth that the world refuses to hear, a truth that will haunt me to my dying day. The night Amelia died, I saw something in that creature's eyes, not just animal instinct, but a cold, calculating intelligence. That intelligence frightens me more than any teeth or claws ever could. I often wonder, was it really hunting us? Or were we merely prey in its cruel game? Does it remember me, the one who got away? 
There are nights I think I hear a strange rustling outside my window, the snapping of twigs under an impossible weight. But when I gather my courage and look out into the darkness, I find nothing. It's in those moments of quiet terror that I realize the worst part. They are patient, they are learning, and one day they will return for me. My name is Declan Murphy, and this happened to me in September of 2010. Worked as a backcountry ranger in Glacier National Park, Montana. It's about as wild and rugged a place as you can find in the lower 48. I'd seen my share of grizzlies and mountain lions over the years, but those encounters were straightforward, predictable. What I faced back then, there's no guidebook for that. The call came in on a crisp autumn morning. A group of hikers reported a missing friend just off an unmarked trail near one of the park's many glacial lakes. My partner Amelia and I grabbed our gear and headed out. A couple of greenhorns out of their depth, that was our initial assumption. We reached the trailhead around midday. The group was there, frantic and shaken. They told a story not of getting lost, but of something else entirely. They swore their friend was snatched, dragged off into the underbrush so fast none of them got a clear look at what took him. Amelia and I exchanged worried glances. The area was known bare territory, yes, but a brazen daylight abduction. Didn't fit the usual pattern. Still, duty called. I loaded my rifle and chambered around as we began following their tracks. The forest here was ancient the dense canopy creating an almost perpetual twilight. We found the spot a short distance off trail. Signs of a struggle were unmistakable. Trampled brush, scuff marks on the soft ground, and drops of blood staining the vibrant fallen leaves. I signaled to Amelia, and we advanced with weapons drawn, senses on high alert. Then I saw a flash of movement just ahead, half veiled by the foliage. Heart pounding, I motioned for Amelia to flank right as I cautiously moved forward. It wasn't a bear. It was far too tall, its limbs impossibly long and skeletal. And those eyes. They glowed a malevolent green in the gloom. The creature crouched low, observing us, then vanished into the trees with unnerving speed. I swore under my breath. We radioed HQ, our voices tense as we described the situation. Our supervisor sounded skeptical, but backup was dispatched. We decided to track it, maybe scare it off, maybe find any trace of our missing hiker, alive or otherwise. The creature left subtle signs, like a predator toying with its prey. Broken branches, the occasional smear of blood on a tree trunk, not the victim's blood, something else. The deeper we ventured, the more unnerved I became. It was as if we were the ones being hunted. Amelia must have felt it too, because her usual easy-going banter had dwindled. The sun began its descent, casting long shadows through the trees. That's when we found the clearing. In its center were the grisly remains of a deer, stripped almost to the bone, and surrounding it in a crude circle were more animal carcasses, a fox, a mountain goat, their bodies mutilated and torn. It was an offering, or a warning. I looked up and saw the creature perched on a boulder overlooking the gruesome scene. Its sinewy form was stark against the twilight, its green eyes blazing. Suddenly, the creature screeched, loud enough to make the birds scatter from the trees, and charged. Amelia and I barely had time to raise our rifles and fire. The shots connected but the creature seemed more enraged than injured. It lunged at Amelia, swiping with claws that looked as long as knives. She scrambled back, tripped, and I saw the moment she thought she was dead. I fired again, the muzzle flash cutting through the deepening gloom. This time, the creature let out an ear-splitting shriek of pain and staggered back. I yelled for Amelia to get up, and together we retreated, firing to keep the creature at bay. It trailed us for a heart-stopping eternity, its shrieks echoing through the forest. 
we finally staggered onto a logging road, rendezvousing with backup under the harsh glare of vehicle headlights. The official explanation was a rogue bear, of course, but every night, when I close my eyes, I see that unnatural shape bounding through the trees, those glowing green eyes. The missing hiker never found a trace of him. Folks think Amelia and I hyped up our encounter, either from panic or to land a juicy story. I don't care. Deep down, I know what's out there, lurking in those ancient forests. And I know, even though folks call me crazy, that it's only a matter of time until it strikes again. I stayed on as a ranger for a few more years, a stubborn knot of defiance twisting in my gut until I finally burned out. Moved south, found work as a wildlife guide. Safer, mostly. Sometimes, late at night, I watch the edge of the woods near my cabin. I see shadows that seem to twist and elongate unnaturally, and I hear the rustle of leaves where the wind shouldn't reach. And I wonder, does it remember me, the ranger who fought back? Does it wait, its patience as inhuman as its grotesque form, or has it moved on to other, easier prey? I keep a rifle nearby, just in case. My name is Elias Forrester, and this happened to me in October of 1994. I've spent the past few decades as a park ranger here in the sprawling wilderness of Yellowstone National Park. Don't get me wrong, I love the trees and the fresh air, but it can get lonely up here. Some nights it's just me, the starlight, and the sound of a million nocturnal creatures scuttling in those dense woods. Not exactly the most social environment. October always brings a chill to the park, a warning that winter will soon settle into its long sleep. This particular day, the sky was a steely gray, and leaves crunched under my boots as I followed the familiar trail toward the old fishing hole. I had a report of an abandoned campsite. Happens every year. Some eager outdoorsmen get caught unprepared when the temperature drops fast. Usually, it's just a forgotten tent and some half-eaten granola bars. I crested a low hill and spotted the campsite down in the small clearing below. Sure enough, a crumpled tent sagged in a corner, flapping against its ropes. All right, let's get a closer look, I muttered, and headed down the slope. The campsite was as messy as I expected. Scattered food wrappers, an open backpack spilling clothes, and a fire pit with barely cold ashes. Nothing too out of the ordinary except... I frowned as I picked my way through the scattered gear. There were no footprints leading away from the camp. It appeared as though whoever had been here vanished into thin air. Now, a missing person isn't the same as foul play, but it was unsettling nonetheless. I decided to conduct a quick search of the surrounding area before contacting the Central Ranger Station. Just the usual procedure. I circled the clearing, scanning for any sign of a trail or footprints in the soft earth. It was as I neared the tree line that I saw it. A dark smear on a low-hanging branch just out of immediate sight. I moved closer, brow furrowing. Blood. And not a small amount either. It dripped and spattered along the length of the branch, as if something large and wounded had thrashed along it. The unease in my gut hardened into something cold. This was no longer a simple case of a lost hiker. Something was seriously wrong. Hey! I called out, my voice echoing in the still air. Is anyone there? There was no response, just the rustling of leaves in the breeze. Nerves prickling, I reached for the radio at my belt, then stopped. If something had done this to a person, what if it was still nearby? My service pistol felt reassuringly heavy at my waist. I followed the trail of blood into the dense undergrowth, pushing through prickly branches, my heart pounding a heavy rhythm in my ears. It led me further into the shaded heart of the forest, the light dappling and unsteady through the leaves. With every step, the blood seemed to thicken, 
splattered unnaturally high on the trunks and leaves. Something was dragging a body, something big. Suddenly, an ungodly sound cut through the silence. It wasn't quite a growl or a roar, but a guttural sound filled with hunger and violence. It came from ahead. Fear jolted me into action. I broke into a sprint, skidding on the wet leaves and clutching branches for balance as I followed the sounds. Bursting through a final tangle of undergrowth, I stumbled into a small, secluded clearing and froze. Before me, a monstrosity feasted. My stomach clenched. I couldn't look away, even as nausea churned within me. It was like a bear, but taller, standing on its powerfully muscled hind legs. Its fur was dark and matted, smeared with blood that didn't seem to be its own. Massive clawed paws, larger than any bear's, tore at something on the ground. I made out the tattered remains of, of what was once a person. There was no time for rational thought, only reaction. I raised my pistol, fingers trembling. The creature turned its head, and I almost dropped the gun at the sight of those eyes. Not animal eyes. They held a terrifying glint of intelligence, burning a malevolent yellow in the shadowy light. It snarled, revealing rows of razor-sharp teeth. I fired. Once, twice, three times. The gunshots echoed like thunder in the clearing, and somewhere in the far back of my mind, I knew it was hopeless. The bullets might have stung, might have inflicted pain, but against something this large, this powerful, they weren't going to stop it. The creature charged, a blur of muscle and rage. I threw up my hands instinctively, a pitiful shield against the mass of fur and fury hurtling towards me. My world narrowed to a whirlwind of motion and sound, the creature's guttural roar, the sharp crack of branches under its weight, the pounding of my own terrified heart. Then, impact. I stumbled backward, gasping, the force of the creature slamming into me nearly bowling me over. I managed to keep my balance, scrambling back with desperate, fumbling steps. My pistol was gone, likely knocked from my hand when I fell. The creature lunged, its massive claws slicing the air where my head had been seconds earlier. Pain exploded along my arm, a hot, wet sensation followed by a dizzying wave of nausea. I'd been clawed badly. Blood soaked through my sleeve and dripped from my fingers with every movement. Despite the shock and the pain, primal adrenaline kept me moving. I circled, searching for an escape, but the clearing was small. Surrounded by trees, I didn't have time to climb. The creature stalked me, its movements sinuous, predatory. Its yellow eyes glittered, filled with a cold, calculating malice that filled me with more dread than the pain. It knew this was a game, and it was enjoying the chase. Panic threatened to swallow me whole. I couldn't die out here. Not like this. Not... My foot struck something solid and unyielding. Glancing down, my heart skipped a beat. My gun lay half-buried in the dirt and fallen leaves. I dove for it, fingers fumbling, praying the creature didn't charge again before I could grab it. Luck, or perhaps some strange twist of fate, was on my side. Just as the monster tensed to spring, my hand closed around the grip. I rolled, bringing the gun up just as the creature landed in a spray of leaves. I didn't aim, didn't have time. I just fired over and over until the gun clicked empty. Searing pain flared in my injured arm with each recoil, but I couldn't stop. The creature staggered, roared, and whipped its massive head back and forth. I saw blood blossoming on its flank, but it wasn't enough. It wasn't slowing. It crouched, preparing for another attack. This was it. This was the end. Then, from behind me, came another roar. More urgent, more desperate. The creature hesitated, its yellow eyes flickering toward the edge of the clearing. In that split second of distraction, I shoved myself to my feet and ran. I didn't look back. I couldn't. Branches tore at my clothes, my skin, the pounding in my head threatening to overwhelm me. 
I ran until my lungs burned and my legs felt like they would give out, until the sounds of the clearing faded into the background. Then, I collapsed, gasping for breath, under the shadowed canopy of ancient trees. My body screamed in protest, the pain in my arm agonizing. Dizziness washed over me. I fumbled for my radio, struggling to focus my eyes on the buttons. Ranger Forrester, my voice cracked through the static. Ranger Forrester, emergency, unknown creature, clearing. My surroundings spun and blurred, my grip on the radio slipping. Words turned to nonsense, spilling from my lips in a panicked rush until darkness swallowed me whole. I woke to the beeping of a heart monitor and the antiseptic smell of the hospital. A wave of relief washed over me, swiftly followed by a flood of horrific memories. I tried to bolt upright, but the movement sent a spike of agony through my bandaged arm. Elias? It was Vanessa, a fellow ranger. Her eyes were wide with concern. Lie back. Don't strain yourself. I blinked, disoriented. What? What happened? Park visitors found you unconscious near the old trail, she explained, her voice gentle but laced with worry. You were badly injured. Lost a lot of blood. It took us hours to even get you to a hospital. The creature, I rasped, the word tasting of bile and fear. Did you find it? Vanessa hesitated. She exchanged a glance with an older man standing beside her bed. I recognized him. Chief Ranger Mitchell. Elias, Mitchell began, his voice low. There was no sign of a creature, no tracks, no other evidence. But, he raised a hand to forestall my protests. We did find this. He held out something small and round, a yellow eye the size of my fist. Glassy and unseeing, yet it seemed to burn with the memory of the monster that possessed it. Animal control believes it's a prop, Vanessa offered. They say it must have been from a hunter or a hiker, maybe a Halloween prank gone wrong. A prank? I whispered, barely believing the words myself. But they offered an explanation, a way to process the unimaginable. My exhausted mind clung to the normalcy they offered. I spent weeks in the hospital, then months in physical therapy. The scars on my arm faded but the memory of the clearing never did. Sometimes, I would jolt awake at night, my breath coming in harsh gasps, as if the creature were still chasing me through the darkness. I returned to work in Yellowstone, a touch thinner and a lot more gray in my beard. The rangers, once quick with jokes and easy smiles, treated me with a wary sort of respect, as if I carried the taint of the unnatural upon me. They never spoke of the incident, and I couldn't bring myself to either. Maybe they believed the animal control explanation, maybe not. It didn't really matter. I still walk the trails, still patrol the serene beauty of the wilderness. But these days, when the trees rustle or the wind sighs, I feel an unsettled chill. My eyes search the shadows a little too often. My hand strays to the comforting weight of my pistol a little too frequently. Because deep down, in the part of me that still believes in monsters lurking in the dark, I know the truth. Whatever I faced in that clearing wasn't a prop or a prank. It was real. And someday, it might be back. My name is Callie Whitman, and this happened to me in October of 2012. I'm a ranger for Sequoia National Park, been one since college. Love the trees, the open sky, all that good stuff. Makes up for the low pay and tourists who think feeding wild animals is a good idea. Late one afternoon, I got a call over the radio about a group of hikers who hadn't returned from the Redwood Canyon Trail. They were two couples from Germany, experienced outdoorsy types going off the official path for some more remote exploration. I grabbed one of the park ATVs and headed out. It was nearly dusk when I reached their last known location. Their backpacks were dumped beside a stream, camera, supplies, the works, just lying there. But no sign of the people. That felt wrong. 
even if they got turned around, you don't just ditch your gear for the bears to enjoy. I drew my gun, scanning the rapidly darkening woods. Suddenly, a horrible cry rang out from deeper in the trees. Sounded human, but with an undercurrent of... something else. Raw, desperate, and cut short in a terrifying, wet gurgle. My blood ran cold. I moved towards the sound, pistol ready. Rounding a bend, I saw... well, I'm still not sure exactly what. One of the hikers, a woman, half sprawled on the ground, clothes torn open. Blood spattered everywhere, but the amount seemed impossible. I didn't see any wounds as such, more like she'd been ripped apart from the inside out. Then, the trees behind her rustled. Out of the shadows stepped the biggest damn bear I'd ever seen. It towered over me on its hind legs, easily eight feet tall. Fur not brown, but a sickly mottled gray-green, hanging loose like it was half-rotted. Its eyes, they were yellow and wide, with slitted pupils like a snake's, and burning with a hunger that had nothing to do with just needing a meal. My first shot hit its center mass, sent the creature staggering. Second shot tore through its shoulder. Thing roared, the sound shaking leaves off the trees, and charged on all fours. I emptied the entire clip into it. Blood sprayed, its fur was blasted clear off in patches, but it didn't stop. It hurtled towards me, a monstrous, unstoppable wall of muscle and rage. I ducked as it lunged overhead, the stink of its breath hot on my neck. It hit a tree trunk, hard enough to crack the bark, and I whirled, grabbing for my backup handgun. My fingers fumbled, it fell into the damp leaves, and the creature was on me again, a whirlwind of teeth and claws. I screamed, throwing up my arms as its paw slammed into my side. Pain exploded, then a weird feeling like my whole body was being jerked sideways. I realized with a jolt that it had caught my gun belt, was dragging me along the ground. I kicked at its legs, desperately reached back for anything to grab hold of. My fingers closed around a thick root just in time. The monster yanked, my shoulder screaming in protest, but I held on, feet digging into the dirt. The tug of war lasted for agonizing seconds, the creature roaring, drool dripping from its monstrous jaws. Then, with a sickening tear, my belt ripped, along with a whole chunk of my uniform. The creature stumbled, momentarily distracted, and I scrambled back, scrambling for my dropped pistol among the leaves. I found it just as the beast turned, its yellow eyes narrowing as it focused on me anew. It let out a guttural snarl and charged. I fired blindly, once, twice, three times. I heard a wet thudding sound, and it stumbled, faltering mid-stride. I aimed again, finger tightening on the trigger, and then… nothing. The gun clicked empty. I stared in horror as the creature slowly straightened, those terrible eyes fixed on me. There wasn't enough time to reload. It moved with a surprising loping speed, blurring towards me across the ground. I closed my eyes, then threw up an arm as its claws raked down. Sharp pain, a burst of searing heat, and then… silence? I opened my eyes. The creature was gone. Slowly, cautiously, I stood. My arm burned like fire and blood soaked my sleeve. I glanced down and immediately wished I hadn't. Three deep gashes ran down to the bone, and I could see… something shiny and white within them. My vision swam, my stomach threatening to heave up what little lunch I'd had. I stumbled in the direction of the trail, clutching the ragged edges of my shirt around the wounds. Every few steps, the world would tilt and spin. I must have passed out at some point, because the next thing I remember is waking up under a dazzling spotlight in the back of a helicopter. Medics hovered around me, their voices distorted and far away. I tried to explain what had happened, but the words wouldn't form right. They kept saying, bear, attack, nodding, looking at my wounds like this was all normal. The next few days were a blur of hospital beds and disbelieving park staff. I told them everything I remembered, but they only looked concerned and muttered things like trauma 
and hallucinations. Rangers combed the area where the attack happened. No sign of the creature, no bodies of the other hikers. My gun belt was found, torn to shreds, but no gun. The doctors patched me up as best they could, but the wounds across my arm were deep. They left angry, jagged scars and a lingering weakness that made it hard to grip my gun properly, or even lift heavy gear. After a month, they released me with a long list of physical therapy appointments and a note that I was on light duty for the foreseeable future. I moved back into my little cabin nestled on the edge of the park. It felt emptier than usual, even with my old dog, Rusty, for company. Nightmares plagued me. The crushing weight of the creature, its fetid breath, those terrible eyes. I started leaving the lights on even when I slept, gun tucked under my pillow. News of the attack made the local papers. I got a few calls from reporters all wanting the scoop on the monstrous bear, but I refused to talk. The official ranger's report chalked the whole thing up to a freak encounter with a bear that must have been rabid, or territorial, or something. The higher-ups seemed all too eager to close the case and hush it up. I tried to go back to work, to pretend everything was normal, but it wasn't. The forest felt different. Every creak of a branch, every rustle of leaves had me whirling around, fingers hovering over my weapon. My fellow rangers watched me with worried eyes, and I began getting mostly desk assignments, filing paperwork instead of patrolling the wilds. It grated. I'd chosen this life for the freedom of it, the thrill of being out in the untamed wilderness. Now, the idea of venturing into the trees filled me with an unshakable dread. My determination warred with a constant simmering fear. I started spending my days off alone, hiking short trails closer to park boundaries, trying to desensitize myself. Rusty trotted by my side, a furry, growling security blanket. Little by little, that knot of anxiety loosened. Not gone, never fully gone, but manageable. Then, one afternoon, everything changed. I was out on a well-traveled trail, one of those wide, graveled affairs that tourists with strollers flock to. Rusty was ahead, sniffing in the undergrowth, when I noticed something odd, a glint of metal half buried in the dirt. I bent down and unearthed a mangled pair of eyeglasses, German make from the look of them. My heart sank. This was close to where the hikers had disappeared. I shoved the glasses in my pocket, marking the spot on my GPS, and called the base camp. The search team went in hard this time. Dogs, thermal imaging, the whole nine yards. Two days later, they made a grim discovery in a hidden ravine. The bodies of three of the hikers, or what was left of them. The cause of death was brutally clear. Word got back to me. They'd been torn apart just like that first victim, and like something had been chewing on the bones. Officially, those deaths were added to the bear attack file. But now there was a new directive. Bring in professional wildlife trappers. Tranquilize the creature and relocate it, if it was even a bear. I watched the trappers set up near where I'd found the glasses. Huge metal cages, baited with roadkill, cameras rigged up everywhere. They told me to stay away, that the area was off limits. I agreed, but my nights became restless again. It was out there, still hunting, and they were going to bring it in closer. It happened a week later. I was sitting in my cabin, trying to ignore the heavy rain pounding the roof, when my phone buzzed with an emergency alert. The creature had taken the bait. It was in one of the cages, thrashing and raging, and the trappers were en route to sedate it. They wanted me there, the one who had previous experience. I couldn't ignore the order, especially not with how those hikers' remains had been found. With a sense of grim determination, I got into my truck, Rusty whining nervously in the passenger seat. When I reached the site, it was chaos. Searchlights pierced the darkness, rain lashed down, shouts carried on the wind. The metal cage looked dented, its bars bent. Whatever was inside wasn't just big, it was monstrously strong. 
The trappers huddled nearby, rifles loaded with trank darts. Then, I saw it. A hulking shape emerged from the shadows, illuminated for a brief moment as it passed under a spotlight. That loose, rotting fur, the impossibly long limbs, those glowing eyes. My stomach lurched, but I forced back the bile. I couldn't back down now. Whitman, stay with the group, yelled one of the trappers. I ignored him, moving cautiously toward the cage. Rusty snarled, hackles raised, straining at his leash. It smelled me, knew what I was. A low, guttural growl emanated from the cage. I stopped a few feet away, gun raised. Not my service weapon. This was my dad's old hunting rifle. More power behind it. Let me get a clear shot, I yelled over the roaring wind. The trappers glanced at each other hesitating. Then, as if sensing weakness, the creature lunged at the bars with a deafening clang. One trapper swore and fired a dart. It bounced harmlessly off the matted fur. It roared in fury and lunged again. Time seemed to slow. The metal bars shrieked and buckled. I saw the trapper's faces pale. This wasn't going to hold for long. I took aim, squeezing the trigger. The gunshot echoed through the night. The creature staggered, and a low, choking sound emerged from its throat. I fired again and again. It slumped back, a dark mass heaving and twitching within the cage. The trappers finally came to their senses, swarming closer and firing trank after trank until the creature went limp. Silence fell except for the drumming rain. I lowered the rifle, my hands shaking. I had done it or so I thought. But as I approached the cage, the creature's eyes snapped open, burning with malevolent fury. It was playing dead. My shout of warning was too late. The weakened bars gave way with a final, mangled groan. The creature burst forth, a whirlwind of claws and teeth and impossible speed. It snatched one of the trappers, a sickening crunch carried on the wind, and then vanished back into the darkness. The aftermath was a blur of panicked shouts, searchlights cutting wildly, and the barking of the tracking dogs let loose from their leashes. I stumbled back to my truck, Rusty whimpering as I shoved him inside. I had to get out of there, away from this place. But where do you go when the monsters are real, and the refuge of the wilderness is tainted with blood and death? My name is Talia Novak, and this happened to me in September of 2016. I've been with the National Park Service nearly a decade. Started out in Zion National Park with all its red rock and scorching heat. But a couple of years back I transferred to Olympic National Forest in Washington. Love the deep green, the rain, the quiet of the old growth forests. Most of the job is mundane. Trail maintenance, radioing and supply requests, and the occasional chat with over-enthusiastic campers about fire safety. Sometimes, when the weather turns bad, there's search and rescue for lost hikers. But what happened a few falls back? Well, there's no training manual for that. It began with the reports. Hikers returning with wild stories, odd sounds in the night, a sense of being watched, glimpses of hulking figures just beyond the tree line. At first, it's easy to dismiss. Tired minds playing tricks in the dense forest. But after the third, fourth, fifth report, with near identical details, that uneasy feeling starts gnawing at you. The incident that set everything off involved a family. The Campbells. Two parents, three kids, the usual overloaded backpacks and bickering over trail mix. They got a late start on a planned three-day loop, figured they could make it through before a forecasted storm rolled in. They never made it out. When they were two days overdue, their emergency beacon still silent. My partner Ethan and I were sent to find them. We hiked their planned route, scouring the woods. On the morning of the third day, we stumbled upon their campsite. Or what was left of it. The tent looked like it had been torn apart by a wild animal, belongings scattered across the forest floor. 
No blood. That was the odd part. But something else sent shivers down my spine. We found footprints. Huge things. Far larger than any human foot. And claw marks gouged into the bark of a nearby tree. Right then, I knew with chilling certainty, the hiker reports weren't drunken ramblings or overactive imaginations. Our calls for the Campbell family went unanswered. We tracked their trail deeper into the woods, Ethan's rifle at the ready. With every step, that sense of unease grew stronger, a prickling at the back of my neck. We weren't alone out here. By mid-afternoon, the rain began, a light drizzle at first, then steadily growing heavier. Visibility worsened, the thick canopy of leaves overhead reducing the daylight to an eerie twilight. We pushed on, the only sound the rhythmic crunch of our boots on the sodden earth and the relentless drum of the rain. Then we heard it, a low growl echoing through the trees. The hair on my arms stood on end. Ethan and I exchanged a look, a silent question hanging in the air. We moved closer, rifles raised, our senses on high alert. The growl came again, louder this time, followed by the crashing of undergrowth just ahead. We froze, straining to see through the gloom. Then, it emerged from the mist-shrouded forest. It was huge, a towering mass of muscle and tangled dark fur. Its height was impossible, at least eight feet even when hunched. It moved with unnatural fluidity, long limbs stretching the ground it covered with each terrifying stride. But it was the eyes that haunted me, burning yellow orbs, devoid of any warmth or animal recognition. They focused on us, and a primal sort of terror seized me. Easy, easy, I whispered to Ethan, though we both knew it was pointless. This wasn't a bear or a cougar gone rogue. This was something else, something old and unnatural. Its lips peeled back in a snarl, revealing rows of jagged teeth, far too long for any animal I knew. And then it charged. We fired, both of us, the sound of the shots deafening in the rain-soaked forest. The creature let out a roar that shook the very trees, the sound both guttural and filled with an unsettling, chilling intelligence. One of the bullets seemed to make contact, the creature stumbling slightly, but it didn't stop its advance. Ethan yelled for me to run. I didn't need telling twice. Panic fueled my flight. Branches slapped at my face, roots snagged at my feet, but I kept moving, propelled by blind terror. The sound of the creature crashing through the forest behind me only spurred me on. I could hear Ethan's shouts, growing fainter. He'd been buying me time. I stumbled out onto a narrow dirt road, a stroke of pure luck. A truck rumbled past, and I flagged it down frantically. The driver, a grizzled logging foreman, stared at me, wild-eyed and covered in mud, but he didn't hesitate. He hauled me into the cab and we sped off, the sound of the downpour pounding on the roof. I reported everything back at the ranger station. Official accounts put it down as an animal attack. Ethan's body was never found, swallowed whole by the wilderness. They offered me counseling, time off, but I just wanted back out there. It didn't make sense, I knew that. But the thought of that creature still roaming free, lurking in the shadows of the forest, set a cold fire in my belly. They won't let me go back alone. My new partner, Jackson, is green. Keeps a wary eye on me like I'm one step away from snapping completely. He's not wrong. I catch myself scanning the trees every time we're out on patrol, studying animal tracks for any sign of those impossibly large footprints, listening for any hint of that chilling, guttural growl. Weeks turned into months, and the constant vigilance wore me down. Every creak in my cabin at night sent jolts of terror through me. I'd wake gasping for air, convinced its monstrous yellow eyes were staring in through the window. Jackson noticed the change, the dark circles under my eyes, the way I flinched at every sudden sound. He was a good guy, trying his best within the confines of standard procedure. But we both knew there was no procedure for what we'd seen out there. Then came the whispers, 
carried on the wind by other hikers, hunters, and those who lived on the fringes of the forest. Sightings of a giant shadowy figure, reports of livestock being torn apart, and eerie howls piercing the night air. The official explanation remained. Wild animal, likely a rogue bear. The local papers picked up the story, fueling speculation and fear that simmered just beneath the surface of normalcy. I sought out those who had similar tales. A grizzled old hunter who claimed to have seen it from his tree stand. A backpacker whose friend vanished during a night hike, their bodies never found. We became an unofficial society, bound by a shared trauma nobody else truly understood. We kept records, mapped sightings, pored over old folklore, desperate for any clue as to what we were up against. One moonless night, driven by a mix of recklessness and desperation, I ventured back into the woods alone. Armed with my rifle, a hunting knife that felt pathetically small, and a battered flashlight, I returned to the clearing where we'd first encountered the creature. The rain-washed ground showed no trace of the struggle, but the memory was burned into my mind with a brutal clarity. Talia, what the hell are you doing out here? Jackson's voice cracked through the darkness, laced with an odd mix of anger and fear. He must have been following me. The thought brought a flicker of warmth amidst the gnawing tension. Had to see it for myself, I said, keeping my voice steady. Needed to be sure I wasn't going crazy. He didn't reply, but I heard him moving closer, the rustle of leaves under his boots. We stood there in silence, the air thick with unspoken understanding and the lurking presence of the forest. Then, the growl. Deep, rumbling, echoing through the trees. I spun, raising my rifle, but the darkness was impenetrable. My flashlight beam cut a swath across the damp undergrowth, revealing nothing. It's circling us, Jackson whispered, his voice tight. We moved back to back, scanning the impenetrable shadows, the silence broken only by our ragged breaths and the frantic pounding of our hearts. Minutes stretched into eternity. We held our position, waiting for the inevitable attack. But then the growl faded, swallowed by the oppressive silence of the woods. It was gone, at least for now. We retreated back to my cabin, a wordless agreement settling between us. The unspoken question lingered in the air. What did we do now? In the harsh light of my living room, Surrounded by familiar objects and the normalcy I'd clung to, there were only two options. Stay and fight or turn and run. We chose to fight. The next few weeks were a blur of planning, preparation, and defiance against the bureaucratic red tape that threatened to smother any action. We reached out to our network of believers, gathering them in my shadowy cabin, the hunter, the backpacker, a local woman steeped in indigenous lore. We pooled our knowledge, our theories, and our fears. The creature, we came to realize, wasn't merely a predator. It was intelligent, cunning. The missing persons, the torn livestock, it was marking territory, driving fear into the hearts of those who dared tread within its domain. And if we didn't act, its territory and its reign of terror would only grow. We made a plan, a reckless, desperate plan, born out of a shared, unspoken acceptance that we might not all survive this. Our ragtag group, armed with hunting rifles, old knives, and a fierce determination, set out into the heart of the encroaching darkness. The forest felt different this time, not only alive but hostile, aware of our presence. We followed where the sightings led, where the creature had left its monstrous footprints and haunting growls. Each step was a calculated risk, each rustle of leaves a potential ambush. The confrontation when it finally came was both terrifying and anticlimactic. It emerged from the dense fog, its hulking form dwarfing us all. Its eyes gleamed with that same chilling light, fixing on us with what felt like malevolent intent. We fired. The shots rang out in the clearing, a staccato of defiance. 
The creature let out a roar that rattled the leaves, but it didn't fall. It lurched forward, a wounded, enraged beast, but also something more. There was a flicker in its eyes, something akin to surprise, perhaps even a tinge of fear. It turned then, not in retreat, but in a tactical maneuver I recognized from countless nature documentaries. It wasn't alone. Two more figures materialized from the mist, just as large, just as monstrous. That was our breaking point. Outnumbered and outgunned, we ran. The aftermath was swift and brutal. The park was closed indefinitely. Government agents descended, silencing witnesses, sanitizing accounts. Our group scattered, forced back into the shadows. We became the whispered legend, the crazy park rangers who saw monsters in the woods. Jackson vanished. Some say he left the country, others swear they've seen him venturing back to the edge of the woods, eyes fixed on the tree line. I'm still here. My cabin feels less like a sanctuary and more like a cage within a vast, encroaching wilderness. The creature, or creatures, haven't been seen in some time. The official word is that the threat is gone, but I know better. Sometimes at night, when the trees creak and groan in the wind, I think I hear the echo of that blood-curdling roar. I keep my rifle loaded, waiting. Because out there, in the deepest, darkest corners of the forest, the boundary has shifted. We are no longer the undisputed apex predators, and the uneasy truce between man and nature has shattered, leaving an untamed, monstrous wilderness, and those who dare to walk its shadowed paths forever changed.